Um, can you all hear me okay? Super. Okay, first of all, um, I would like to very, very warmly welcome you. Um, it's really great to see so many of you here. Um, and hang on, I'm just trying to get one more technical thing right there we go. So I'm so pleased to see so many of you could join us today um, for this first Emerge event in 2021. My name is Anna Katharina Schaffner. I'm the new director of Emerge and I, I will be chairing this uh, meeting today. I'm a writer and a coach and a professor of cultural history at the University of Kent. Um, and our event today is called Agency, What are the Inner Conditions for Intentional Action? Um, and we're incredibly proud to have Jamie Bristow and Rosie Bell from the Mindfulness Initiative here with us, as well as Ronan Harrington, the founder of Alter Ego. And thank you also to Ivo Mensch, who is chairing um, the technical side of things today. Um, and Jamie and Rosie have recently published an incredibly important paper on the uh, continued urgent relevance of mindfulness in our times. And they reflect in this tape, they reflect um, in this paper on how mindfulness can help us address the complex challenges of the 21st century and it can and how it can help us hone our capacity both for individual and collective, agency and wise action taking and they present what i think is an incredibly strong case for how mindfulness can hone our psychological capacity for addressing the meta crisis the crises of climate environment political polarization psychological alienation and social inequality chief amongst them and they will talk about how mindfulness may help us cultivate essential qualities such as dealing with complexity dwelling in uncertainty honing our attention regulation and our ability to be discerning and perspective taking and their paper is really an incredible incredibly powerful plaidoyer for the value of mindfulness in the sphere of human agency and social change. And some of the key questions they address, namely how inner and outer change are connected, how we can respond to the meta crisis in a meaningful way, and how psychotechnology such as mindfulness can support collective system change endeavors are also at the very heart of the Emerge project. And when I read Jamie's and Rosie's paper, I felt it was of the most urgent relevance for us. And in fact, I underlined so much in my paper that it turned into a sea of yellow and my underlinings turned completely pointless in the process. And that happens to me really very rarely. So I really urge you to read this paper if you haven't already done so. Um, and Rosie's and Jamie's paper has been met with an overwhelmingly positive response and been described as seminal, as groundbreaking, as full of gold insights and a tour de force. Um, and I just briefly wanted to outline the structure of this event today. So I will start by introducing Jamie, Rosie and Ronan. And Jamie and Rosie will then talk about some of the key points in their paper for about 20 minutes. And then Ronan and I will ask some questions and then we will open up the discussion for all of you. Um, and it would be really helpful if you could put your questions in the chat box um, and or pu put plus signs behind the questions you like um, and the questions you would like to see answered most pressingly. And if you could mark your questions with a Q so we know their questions, that would be really great. And we will then um, select the questions that you would most like to see answered and call on you to ask them in person. So um, on to the introductions now. Rosie Bell is a freelance writer and a regular contributor to mindfulness initiative content. And Rosie has worked for numerous mindfulness and well-being innovators, including headspace.com. And Rosie uh, used to be an opera singer, and she is currently a master student in international public and political communication at the Sheffield University School of Journalism. 
Jamie Bristow is director of the Mindfulness Initiative, a policy institute about mindfulness and compassion training that grew out of a program of mindfulness teaching for politicians in the British Parliament. And I'm sure you've all heard of this hugely successful and extremely important initiative. The Mindfulness Initiative provides the secretariat to the UK Mindfulness All-Party Parliamentary Group and help politicians to publish the seminal Mindful Nation UK, UK Policy Report. Jamie now works with politicians around the world to help them make capacities of mind and heart serious consideration for public policy. He has supported the introduction of mindfulness training in over 10 national parliaments. And the Mindfulness Initiative publishes really influential research, pol research and policy reports, toolkits and other resources that are free to access via its website. Um, and of course, we will hear about um, the latest of these publications today in much more detail. And I'm sure most of you are already familiar with Jamie's and Rosie's work. It's reach into the very heart of power here in the UK is, is truly impressive. And Jamie is also a Dharma teacher in training in the insight meditation tradition that's associated with Gaia House. And his teachers and mentors have included Stephen Batchelor, Rob Burby and Christina Feldman. Last but not least, Ronan Harrington is an international keynote speaker and a Generation Y futurist with deep expertise in leadership and transformation. And he's the founder of Alter Ego. Uh, again, I hope we'll hear a bit more about that. Um, and Alter Ego is a European network of leaders working towards a deliberately developmental society. Ronan is also head of storytelling at Rethink X, a think tank that analyzes technological disruption and its consequences for society. Um, and now I would like to pass straight on to Jamie and Rosie, who will introduce some key points um, from their paper. So over to you, Jamie and Rosie. Thank you so much, Anna. It's a real, real pleasure. Um, and uh, can you hear me okay? Is that a, I couldn't tell, it. okay, great. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, real pleasure to be here today. We had the Emerge community in mind when we wrote this paper and the, the community of, of, of thinkers, innovators, practitioners who have made up this network of networks have produced work which is which have been incredibly influential, um, and really, you know, we're, we're sort of standing on the shoulders of of, a, of giants to a, to a great extent. Uh, you may have noticed, if you're familiar with this with this space, you may have noticed that we've sort of peppered uh, the document with uh, quotes and references from from some of those uh, who are really associated with it. And one of the reasons for that is, you know, we 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 felt that. The mindfulness world, teaching world internationally, could um, have a broader perspective for itself to understand its own potential for, for social change and to, to evolve and, and develop in that direction. And then I, I notice a couple of uh, key innovators in the, in, in the space on the call here today. And then also those people in the social change world, particularly those who have some sense already of the importance of the inner dimension, um, helping them to understand the, what mindfulness could bring um, to, to social change work and bring those two worlds closer together. So actually this call is kind of a culmination of that, as I see many mindfulness practitioners and many social change people, and, and to hear together, you know, this is a discussion paper to try and stimulate debate and dialogue. So I would love to find ways to, to create further connections between all you uh, on, in, this, uh, in this call together to, to, to discuss these, these ideas about who we are, how we show up in the world, how we, how we can act together collectively, skillfully in response to the crises that we face and what practices, what trainings we can deploy in order to make ourselves more, more, more effective and more likely to be equal to the challenges of our times. And so 
as Anna said, our, our work really comes out of a seven year journey by working with politicians and policymakers in the UK and around the world, looking at where mindfulness, initially we looked at where mindfulness training specifically, and we've broadened that uh, more recently to look at compassion training and other um, new, new sort of new innovations, where that kind of fits in public policy, education, hospitals, prisons, etc. But from the very beginning, some politicians were interested in the, in, the, in the more visionary stuff. Like, what does this mean for the social fabric? What does this mean for how citizens interact with each other and, and their relationship with the state and how, yeah, how democracy functions, how, how, we all, how we all live together and act together? So from the very beginning, there's, there's been this sense of like, um, yeah, action and social change. But there hasn't really been, we didn't feel that there was the right language, certainly not an evidence-based language, to be able to talk about this. And so the work that we've, we've, we've conducted by consulting with many experts and you know, going through many different iterations of our narrative, our framework, and of our, our evidence building before we found something that we felt was, was sort of robust enough to at least start the conversation or at least uh, you know, develop the conversation. And so I'm gonna pass over to, to, to Rosie now to introduce to you that, that framework, um, which, We've been told, you know, it's successful partly because it just gives form and words to what, into, what many people have intuitively felt, and what many mindfulness teachers are in, in the game for, if you see what I mean. Um, so yes, over to you. Um, and the, uh, oh yeah, the one thing I'll say is that, yeah, the, 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 the one common factor we found was this, that really pulled it all together was this idea of agency and intentional action as being perhaps the most profound level that, that, that mindfulness can con contribute on. So we'd like to have a conversation today about the inner conditions of agency more broadly, but of course we're coming with you know, our expertise in, in, in mindfulness specifically. So, um, hi everyone, uh, it's lovely to be here. Um, meaningful agency um, has a context. So it's not just a blind potential or a force that can be exerted, but it's sort of an exchange. And so where we need to take in information, operate on it internally to understand it and make sense of it, and then use the resulting intelligence to guide action. Um, so from this is the sort of place we were coming from um, when we arrived at a model of agency that, that has three dimensions of perception, understanding, and action. Um, and that model, um, you, some of you um, may recognize elements of as having some, some influence um, from, um, from Jordan Hall's um, model of sovereignty, but they're also quite important um, departures as, um, as, as we'll discover. Um, so there's, there's sort of this folk assumption that that's how life works, um, that we go around the world collecting information, um, making knowledge out of it, and then acting rationally based on that knowledge. Um, but looking more closely at these um, three dimensions of agency, uh, we find that they're so often compromised um, by forces both um, within us um, and in our cultural environment. And so we tease out these dimensions um, for the purposes of explanation, but we really don't mean to imply um, that, these are, that these are separate faculties in any way, but they, that they all rather co-arise, that they're profoundly interconnected and embedded in one another. Um, so the first um, dimension of agency that we tackle is perception, um, which of course hinges on attention, um, which is very much the, the familiar territory of, of the mindfulness world. Um, and in the context of agency, what's important is the capacity to attend to what's important. Um, so we all know that, um, of course, attention is, is very easily distracted under the best of circumstances. Um, anything that looks like threat, food or a mate um, is likely to, to pull our attention away from, um, from what it is that, that, that we think is important. Um, but in our contemporary environment, um, it's, it's just particularly difficult to be in charge of our own attention with ever more potent market forces um, competing to capture our attention for their own purposes, which are rarely aligned with our best interests. And and using the technology that we invite into our lives um, willingly um, in, in order to do so. Um, and so the attention economy has been in the media um, a lot more in, in, in the last year, um, which makes it um, more uh, easy to convince people at least that, that this is a problem. Um, but so even when we're paying attention, um, our openness to new information 
isn't always what we think it is. Um, so we may think that we're just taking in reality, but we're actually also reliant on cognitive shortcuts. Um, so the assumptions and biases and pre-existing judgments that mean that what we see um, is often just what we already think. And these are essential adaptive ways of navigating um, the world um, that we're not suggesting um, that we abolish, um, but particularly um, in the case of agency. If we're to have real agency, then we need to know that often what we're looking at um, is a preconceived um, is a preconceived idea as opposed to um, taking in sort of the real deal. And there are also factors, particularly um, in, in, in the world as, as we meet it just now, um, that cause us to simply shut down our perception. Um, so the sheer volume um, of information coming at us uh, at all times. Um, but we also talk about the tendency um, to shut down to cognitive dissonance. Um, and when under current circumstances, perhaps more than ever, um, we really need to remain open um, to uncomfortable truths in order to bring about change. So... We won't have time to go into the evidence behind what I'm about to say. And in fact, I'm going to say it very briefly. Um, but I hope I'm going to say enough to interest you to, to check out the document. That's the kind of the ambition today, rather than give you the, 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 the full 360. Mindfulness as is perhaps at its root, a particular form of attention training. As Rosie says, our attention renders the world for us. It binds up all of our different um, sort of cognitive and emotional capacities. Um, and if we uh, are not uh, able to regulate our attention, then somebody else is going to hijack it and control it for us, quite simply. And so um, that's kind of the, the main, main headline is uh, uh, some kind of attention regulation support is necessary in this new, in this new brave new world we're in. But it isn't just any attention training. And in fact, a lot of the misunderstandings about 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 mindfulness are about uh, thinking it's just it's just about calm or it's just about the attention. But it's a particular type of attention with particular qualities, and those qualities make it not value neutral, and bring the kind of therapeutic and, and a lot of the kind of the uh, agentic benefits. Because mindfulness is uh, our ability, our capacity, our natural human capacity to be able to attend to what's happening here and now with openness, curiosity, and care. And if it hasn't got those things, that care and that kindness, that openness and curiosity, and we're just being a mindful sniper, then, I, then, then, then in our way of understanding it, um, and with a lot of the kind, yeah, like a... Um, a lot of the experts that we, that we work with have built this definition, um, uh, then it's not mindfulness. And so the, the um, being able to be open to new and challenging information, to be open to novelty, and not just um, uh, constantly see the world not as it is, but as we are, uh, requires us to, uh, yeah, to be open. And, and this quality of mindfulness underpins not just being able to control the attention, but to open the bandwidth of awareness. Um, and this has implications for, for bias uh, in, in a number of different forms. Uh, a lot of the research for, on mindfulness is around stress and anxiety. And this isn't just a health and well-being thing. I mean, when, when we're chronically stressed, our, our working memory depletes and we struggle to make decisions. And also, we tend to have a narrowed perception. So we don't literally, like in terms of our perceptual field, we see less at the peripheries, but also metaphorically, we're less able to look around and notice things. We get more and more tunnel vision and the more stress is, is, is on us. So for agents of change, it's necessary to shore up our well-being, to reduce our stress so that we don't get cognitively uh, depleted. And this is one way that uh, mindfulness training can help. Uh, that brings us uh, on to uh, the understanding section. <laughs> um, with which I'll try to be brief because we're going to run out of time, aren't we? we are. <laughs> okay, so um, the next dimension of agency that, that, that we sort of unpack in the document is understanding. Um, and I, I guess I can, I can leave to your imaginations the kind of the myriad ways in which our understanding is assailed um, in our current environment. It's kind of, it's a common 
um, it's a common thing to say in the eMERGE world that our kind of, um, that our understanding is need of a quantum upgrade um, amid the, the sort of circumstances that we're facing, but also that these conditions are what conspire to undermine understanding at every level. So, I mean, we're, we're undergoing sort of quite a generalized loss of faith in sort of sense-making institutions like the media, um, Daniel Schmackton talker, Daniel Schmackton talker, it's <laughs> wasted 20 seconds, um, talks, you know, I mean, um, it talks very eloquently about our broken information ecology. And um, so the public commons where we negotiate our truth together um, is increasingly polluted and almost breaking down um, with, with under the weight of, of misinformation. And this kind of feeds into this insidious notion of a, of a post-truth era. Um, and at the same time, societies are becoming increasingly polarized, um, which can mean that we're just abandoning the project of understanding each other and understanding the world and locking down um, on very inflexible ideologies. Um, social media is feeding into these dynamics and entrenching them further in our lives and um, as a consequence really at all levels from sort of political leadership right down to the public sphere we're just squandering what is an immense capacity that we actually have to understand together but that, that we're really just not using. Um, and also um, very familiar territory again for the eMERGE, um, for the eMERGE audience so I won't um, talk um, too much about what you already know but People are beginning to talk now about how our fundamental worldview um, as, a, as a framework for understanding just might not be serving us. Um, and the very deepest way that we grasp what we think of as the world and just how it is, um, is really just another set of ideas um, that are contributing to the meta crisis. And so this totality of interconnected human global crises um, is sort of stemming from our tendency to interpret the world in a particular way that's just unequal to its complexity. And um, so the inner dimension of the meta crisis and um, we talk of as a, as a crisis of understanding. And I'm going to uh, take this opportunity actually just to, it might actually save us a bit of time um, uh, to just show you the, um, actually can I share my screen? I haven't already asked this. Eva, there's a keeping you on your toes. If you can let me share the screen, I'll, 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 I'll uh, share the kind of framework so I can. I can yeah, you should be able to share your screen right now. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, looking in our uh, understanding section, can you all see a, a, a table there with three sections? Yeah, great. So um, in the uh, understanding, making sense and making decisions chapter, we look, we look at four broad areas of evidence that, sh that, that looks at um, mind training and mindfulness as help, being helpful um, for us to navigate this territory. The first one you might recognize, particularly if you're familiar with the work of uh, Ian McGilchrist, uh, and it's looking at how, how uh, cognitive scientists who work on mindfulness, particularly John Teasdale, uh, think that a lot of the benefit comes from a kind of uh, balancing of two modes of mind so that we are more able to bring to bear our holistic intuitive capacities and uh, put them in a kind of appropriate balance with our more um, sort of ling linguistic, verbal, logical sort of serial processing versus sort of parallel processing. I won't be able to go into any more detail on that because it's a, uh, it's a noodly one. Uh, mindfulness uh, uh, is very uh, often um, reported anecdotally in terms of qualitative um, uh, reports associated with perspective. And the politicians that we work with actually frequently use this word. It's like one of the top three that they, they, um, they, they reflect on. Yeah, mindfulness helps me with my, with my perspective. It helps me to keep things in perspective and see things from other people's perspectives. Um, and so there's this kind of cognitive flexibility and enable to shift um, shift um, modes of mind, but also but also um, sort of viewpoints. And uh, there's a very particular uh, new perspective that we get on our thoughts through training. So this is metacognitive awareness. It's used in things like CBT as well, um, but it re really underpins uh, uh, our ability to have a bit of separation from our, from our thoughts and our emotions and hold them hold them a little bit more um, uh, with a bit of distance and a bit of perspective it helps us to be reflexive and be less identified with them potentially so that if those ideas are criticized we don't get so so personally 
um, are fronted. Some mindfulness-based interventions uh, really focus on the, um, the benefit of values attunement or value sensitivity attunement and alignment, which is to say, particularly through embodied experience, we become clearer on what is most important to us. And one of the Dutch politicians I work with, uh, very, sort of very clear on this, says that mindfulness helps me to stay, um, uh, to remember what's important uh, and to stay close to my, to my values. Um, and we also look at how um, uh, the kind of collaborative benefits could help with collective sense making. Again, just a taster there, really. And um, uh, we'll have to, we'll have to take a word on the for it on the evidence. So we have actually got two minutes left. Oh, you, all right. To, so yeah. yeah, I won't have a heart attack. Yeah. Um, so once we've lined up our perception and our understanding, um, it's time to carry out our well-founded intentions. Um, and again, this might be less straightforward um, than we're given to thinking. And um, we tend to think of action as intentional, um, but actually uh, intention isn't always behind our actions. And um, yeah, again, this, this legacy of evolution within us describes the sort of the raft of automatic behaviors in our daily repertoire. It's just all the time. And um, from threat response to all kinds of consuming behaviors, there are just things that we do um, often in spite of our, um, of our best intentions. So we talk about this problem of automatic action. Um, but um, what we also talk about re um, regarding action is how um, the complexity of the challenges that we face in, in, our, in our lives has made it just ever more untenable um, for individuals to be understanding or to be acting alone. Um, and in a world where we've been fed this narrative that everyone's out for themselves, um, we talk about the, um, the need to consciously cultivate the better angels of our nature um, in the service of social cohesion and collective action. So um, many of the therapeutic benefits of mindfulness come down to this sort of interrupting automatic pilot and being able to, to live more intentionally, or uh, as I like to say, to live more on, on purpose. And that has uh, obvious implications, I'd say, for, for, for agency. As in when we're, we're, a lot of our behavior is conditioned by culture um, or by the legacy of, of, of evolution within us, um, or through just inertia and an and out, outdated habit from our own sort of adaptive strategies. And if we're able to bring more conscious awareness to that and to step out of those things that we, that we consider to be obsolete or unhelpful and construct new, new habits, um, it, it enables us to make change. And so there are consequential applications of mindfulness training to smoking cessation and, and other such sort of addiction and, and, and habit issues. Uh, we spend a lot of time in this, in this chapter looking at um, the way in which uh, mindfulness underpins empathy, compassion, pro-social intentions, behavior, etc. cetera, and, and unpick like to what extent mindfulness includes compassion or mindfulness enables compassion and on that note, you know, I say we're, we're kind of, to some extent, uh, saying that mindfulness training in the way that it's currently taught is, is helpful. We would say it is a net benefit at the moment, but that it probably could be a lot more powerful. It could be combined with different psychotechnologies and psychoeducation components. It could be um, focusing more on, on compassion, empathy, ethics, etc. but that there is evidence threaded through this document, built on built, you know, built this document is built on evidence to say that um, it's you know it's already something we should be taking taking very seriously. Um, and I, yeah, so I'll finish. We are over time, but I, I'll, I'll finish just by saying that you know, the mindfulness evidence base is is now about eight thousand peer reviewed papers. There's approaching four a day coming out on the subject. Uh, it's a lot of that's very new. You know, small trials, but it's but it's quality is improving, um, and uh, and you know we're, we're getting to the point that we can start making uh, uh, confident claims in this area. But it is yeah, I would say it is, however, early days for all of this stuff. Thank you. Back over to you, to you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamie and Rosie. Um, that was a brilliant summary of an incredibly complex and rich paper um 
And there's really so much I'd like to ask you here and to talk about. I wish we had much more time than we do. Um, but I just wanted to zoom in on, on the questions that might, I think, be most relevant for Emerge. So I'm really interested in, Rosie, what you talked about agency and, and much more specifically, the collective action challenge. And so, so you mentioned on one of your slides, um, that mindfulness can help us to collaborate better. Um, and of course, you know, this question of what kind of we we can become and how psychotechnology such as mindfulness can help us there um, is, is really one of the most central questions we're grappling with um, in the Emerge community. And I think it also speaks to this connection between inner transformation and outer social change, you know, between soul systems and society. And that's, of course, also highly relevant for Perspectiva um, more generally. And um, what I wanted to ask you about um, also, Jamie, you mentioned this shift in language and emphasis yourself. So what I was most struck by in your paper is precisely this shift in, in language and emphasis. So I noticed that you moved very much away from mindfulness as an insight or mere stress reduction technology towards um, representing mindfulness as a psychotechnology that hones psychological capacities that are tied to agency and action taking. So there is really a kind of very noticeable shift from being to doing although I, I know you disagree with this crude distinction, Jamie, um, <laughs> and we can talk about that, of course. Um, but uh, what chimed with me was this idea that mindfulness is not a, quote, topical cure for society's ills, but a way of being in a relationship with the world which supports agency, our individual and collective capacity for intentional action. So, so this idea of mindfulness as enhancing our relational capacity and our capacity for wise action. And that's, of course, very, very different from this cliched notion of mindfulness as being all about interiority related values, you know, especially self awareness and insight into the processes of our, of our minds. And I felt that your paper really um, shines the spotlight on how mindfulness can help us cultivate essential qualities such as you know all the points you mentioned attention regulation metacognition cognitive flexibility embodiment emotion regulation and kindness and and these capacities you argue are all absolutely essential for responding to the complex challenges of the 21st century and they also enable us better to deal with complexity, to dwell in uncertainty, and to look at a problem from different perspectives. Um, and overall, I felt that you're representing mindfulness as a potentially really powerful pro-social action and agency enabling rather than the self and insight center technology. So you very explicitly link it with agency and our capacity for intentional action and i just wanted to ask you what prompted this shift and why you felt um the need to reframe mindfulness in this way right now in this particular historical moment of ours mm. great question for me this has always been about skillful response skillful and appropriate response. I started wanting to work in the area of mindfulness training and share these practices with others because when I was, um, uh, because of my experience working in climate change communications and realizing it was my meditation practice that went me from work, took me from working in advertising to wanting to um, do the opposite essentially <laughs> um, that's the way it felt at the time uh, and so it, I always had that sort of social social vision for it um, but I've been publicly I've sort of publicly admitted that you know I, I, I was one of those people who had a somewhat naive vision that that, um, that everyone just had to meditate like me and 
everyone would you know think differently about climate change and 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 be sort of similarly inspired to give up their job and go and work for a charity for free um initially at least and um uh i think uh over yeah over time realizing that actually the 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 the, the, the why of mindfulness matters um the way it's framed the way it's ca couched uh but also so uh, i wanted to um yeah to to uh give sort of yeah form and framework for for those intuitions that i had and and also to uh help those who are practicing um who might just have a kind of uh, an, an interior um, perspective on it to to have a kind of bigger bigger picture that included uh, collective action uh, and also there was a sort of a response to to critique so this um critique of some of the advocates of mindfulness training like John Kabat-Zinn and others who who were saying that this is going to help usher in a, a kind of renaissance in in uh, in uh, in human civilization uh, and i and i do believe that, that it is part of the picture but there needed to but there needed to be a kind of um, support for that perspective that wasn't really um, found in the evidence base in it because it was um, shaped by the, the, the science world and the policy making world which is really siloed and fractured so so the the the, the, um, the method of evidence building um, and the way science works means you have these kind of like oh it reduces depressive relapse by 30 percent or you know it does um, x y or z and, and we needed to do the work of um, threading that together into a uh, a more uh, robust framework and narrative that had that evidence base um, uh, pitched together for it, uh, threaded together for it. I think so. as well there's a kind of, it's a quite a prominent um, topic of, of mindfulness bashing um, to, to sort of say that, that mindfulness is an opiate for the masses and that while while the world is going to hell in a handcart and um, people are telling us to just meditate and kind of like, you know, chill, chill out and turn off. Um, and there was a there was a really strong drive to um, to alert people to the possibility that actually that, that the opposite is true and that to to re-engage and to plug in and to become um, to to become tuned in um to to what is needed and and to your own response to the world um that this is um that this is a a, a powerful practice yeah thank thank you rosie and jamie i think i think you've done an amazing job at you know at just making the case for precisely um the ways in which mindfulness is so much more than you know the mindfulness bashers <laughs> say say it is and and it felt I, to me your paper felt very much like a response to mm -hmm. you know those kind of critiques of mindfulness as um apolitical and as um you know as as not really being powerful instruments of social change and so on and i think you articulated the potential in, in such a precise and evidence-based and, and beautifully framed way here that I, I really, really hope that lots of people are going to read your, your paper. I think it's, um, it's a very, very powerful um, and, and timely and, and important statement. Um, so, so thank you for, for having written it. I think it's the, the most powerful play of year for mindfulness, social usefulness that I, I've ever read. Um, and uh, I, I, keeping an eye on, on time, I think I might just um, pass on to, to Ronan now for, um, for his response and questions. Hi, thanks so much, Anna. Um, yeah, I just wanted to take a moment also just to honor Jamie. I've known Jamie for, you know, maybe five years now. And there's a tendency in our eMERGE world to want to seek refuge in our counterculture. And it takes a particular quality of character to literally don the suit and tie, go into you know, the very difficult world of politics. And even when your heart might want 
a softer, more poetic way of expressing the importance of these ideas to do the hard work of finding the evidence and conveying the evidence. And it's no mean feat to build a network of literally hundreds of MPs around Europe, around the world, who thanks to this evidence are able to take this practice seriously and see the benefits. I always describe that type of approach as a solid invitation into a liquid experience. People who are very mind-based need the facts and figures. The dog of the rational mind needs a bone to chew on so the intuitive mind can kind of leap around and have the experience that its soul essentially knows is true. And, and so, and that's where I see the importance of the mindfulness initiative and the work, Jamie, that you're doing and Rosie, that you're doing. Um, the thing that was coming up for me, if I'm being perfectly honest, again and again, as you spoke, was Harry and Meghan, Prince Harry and Meghan, and, um, and, and, the, uh, and like the bombshell of that news story of the last couple of days. And um, for me, these kind of very explosive, culturally charged, deliciously juicy, gossipy moments in our, in our news cycle, are actually opportunities for us to reflect on how good our sense-making is and our meaning-making and our existential maturity. Um, and, you know, immediately the response to, you know, and for context, it was the interview that they both gave with Oprah, um, where they talked about, you know, someone from the royal family having concerns about the skin of their baby, uh, the skin of their uh, baby-to-be um, and about, you know, Megan feeling suicidal and not getting support. And yet the response to it was basically polarized. And the biggest predictor of it was how you voted on Brexit. And if you were a Remainer, you were likely to see uh, Megan as a victim um, of, uh, you know, institutional racism um, and, um, and a lack of culture of care in, in society around mental health. Um, and if you voted uh, Brexit, um, you would see Harry's actions and the lobbing of a hand grenade into Buckingham Palace is the ultimate betrayal of family values. And, and, and what was interesting was that this, the familiar characters came out on both sides and did their thing. And yet there was an emerging meta conversation about the split that was happening and the ability to actually hold the complexity of that situation that it was a serious thing to do, to do an interview and give no warning to your nearest and dearest and love a hand grenade. And these issues are really serious and they're, they're a product of a betrayal that they feel. And, and as the commentary went further, it was interesting to notice in the mainstream a deepening of analysis that I think is born from essentially personal experience or mindfulness practice. Um, you might have seen the scene on Good Morning Britain where a commentator asked people to imagine what it was like for Harry as a 10 year old to lose his mother and have to walk behind her coffin while the entire world watched him and to think about how tragedy shapes an individual. And these kind of uh, deepenings of analysis where we go below the surface of the immediate reaction and polarization are a product of developing internal capacities. And mindfulness is the practice and the framework that allows us to develop them. But obviously adversity is the initiation or the invitation. And so when I think about this paper, you know, I think about its, our, its ability to help us create um, a new civilization and a, and a new system. But even if it just allowed us to react with more maturity, more care, more perspective on events like that and many other that we face, I think that that's a really good and, and, and practical thing. Um, my question back for you, Jamie, and this is something that I raised when I get feedback on the initial report. When I read it, it reminded me of a line from Alain de Botton's book, Status Anxiety, which I read um, on the platform on the way to a really shitty job in my early 20s. Um, and it was about you know, or uh, how much we crave the status of others and collective approval. And he said that in particular, the energy that we put into work is like a matchstick protest against the wave of our mortality. And there's something really striking about that image, a tiny matchstick in a big wave. And I felt when reading the report that while these mindfulness practices are amazing and have made it and, and do make a difference, 
up against the kind of systemic technological challenges, um, the hijacking of our attention, it feels to me like a matchstick still. You know, like I was at one point during the summer meditating an hour a day for a hundred days. Did I do any less doom scrolling? Did I get into any less internet arguments? No, because the architecture of Facebook is so powerful that it leads you down that rabbit hole every time. And I find it interesting that, you know, a new app like Clubhouse, which is voice only, more focused on dialogue, because it's an external architecture, it actually gives rise to mindful behaviors and competencies and capacities. So my interest is, mm -hmm. if we believe these are the qualities that we need, and we know that some degree of internal practice creates them, what would it look like for systems design, particularly technological infrastructure design based on these principles? And is there any work happening in that space? Mm. Great. Well, I mean, first of all, I just want to echo this sense of there being a shift. Really interesting to hear that being observed in the in the way that we're digesting the Harry and Meghan revelations collectively. I've uh, only been working in policy for for seven years, so um, but in in that short time, I've seen quite a lot of change. I have colleagues who've been working in it for 20, 30 years. And so their so their their word is sort of is weightier than mine. But they say, particularly in you know, in in in, in this period, the language that parliamentarians and policymakers has changed. Like words that were kind of taboo about qualities are are in a world, and even the word love can be used in meetings and private conversations and even in the chamber. And when I first started this stuff, it was really in a mental health frame for, 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 for starters. And it was shortly before the first MP came out with mental health problems. One of the first kind of like hip hop stars, you know, um, uh, the Royals started talking about it. Uh, and to think that actually, you know, just only seven years ago or, or six years ago, even like admitting any kind of mental health issues was a, was a big deal. Um, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been really encouraging and, it, and it's, it's a far cry from being a, a result of um, a, a small community of parliamentarians practicing mindfulness. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a much wider shift um, happening about sort of psychological um, literacy um, and understanding of inner worlds but it's still really early days and only, only a minority that's doing that. Um, and they're, they're showing some leadership and where, you know, where mindfulness could be applied in public policy is really restricted by a more foundational conversation about inner capacities in general, mm -hmm. about, about the inner capacities of our leaders and of, the, and of, of citizens um, and, and the role potentially of, of you know, government and public institutions in investing in those capacities. Um, I think that, uh, yes, you know, I've got, I've got a um, sort of a, a Dharma teacher colleague who says that you know, nothing other than a whole life path is gonna be su sufficient to, to, to really shift someone's life in the way that you've described there, that meditation, even an hour a day is, is, is not enough. Um, and that's a kind of individual level. I mean, I, I do think that even like for some people just a pause for like three minutes before that conversation, before that meeting can, uh, can change the direction of that, of that discussion, of that decision, uh, and can be transform more tra transformative, but certainly impactful. So it's like on the thin end of the wedge, like this stuff isn't completely superficial, even if it's just like, just for three minutes, just stop before you charge into that, you know, that confrontation. You know, that can really change lives. But if we're looking at the real potential of this, yes, at an individual level, it requires more than an eight week course uh, and uh, a commitment in many different ways. And as a society, it, it requires more than just some training programs. And it requires um, a kind of experience design, systems design with, a, with, a, with an understanding of interior capacities and psychological tendencies, et cetera, at the heart of that so we know what we're doing to ourselves we know what we're likely to elicit from each other and from our 
uh, our, our collective processes. And that's the stage that we're getting to in Parliament now. Mm. So politicians that we work with uh, uh, and through the, in, in the all party parliamentary group are now looking at political culture and particularly what would it be to look at mindful politics that isn't totally dependent on individual practice mm. that actually looks at mindful processes and framings and and for instance you know, i visited the finnish parliament to speak to politicians there about this and they have uh, behind the speaker um alfie i think or albert i can't, I can't remember but it's, it, it's a baby looking at the chamber being held by a mother so the mother's got, got her back to the chamber huge golden statue and the baby's there um to represent future generations in the way that the Welsh government are now bringing in legislation to make this you know, enshrined in their processes. So they have a Future Generations Act, which as far as I hear is pretty successful, always bringing all policy back to that question. So, so this statue is a psychological intervention for, for, for Finnish MPs. Um, and you know, are there things like that that we could build into a, to, to a renovated House of Commons, for, for, for instance, but also in our, our digital infrastructure? Um, one other area that can, speaks to the work that I do, so I um, convene a, a network of leaders in activism and politics around Europe, and we also began, uh, and our impetus was, um, you know, spiritualize one of the one of the kind of the founding reports that led to Perspectiva that um, hosts emerge as a network. Um, and that gave us a form and a language that spoke to a private intuition, but it was also naivety in our part, the belief that if only the rest of the world thought like us and act like us and felt like us, it would be a better place. And what we've noticed is that there's a shift that's needed, especially in social change culture that all of us are part of. And the shift that we describe is a shift from what we call ideological micro-nationalism, which is a bit of a mouthful, but the basic idea is a nationalist basically believes in the superiority of their country and are in a competitive dynamic with other countries. That's happening on an ideological level across the board. People feel like their ideology is right, everyone else is wrong, and they're in a competitive dynamic. And it's a shift from that to what we call complicated majorities. If we're going to make a difference mm -hmm. on the big issues of climate change, of social inequality, um, of any, any kind of shared future, we are going to have to build complicated majorities with people who don't think like us and act like us and have very different beliefs and come down on different sides of the Harry and Meghan and Buckingham Palace equation. And what's limiting us is us being trapped by ideological lenses. We are, they have us rather than us having them. And I think that that's a really practical way in which mindfulness can help us perspective take. Um, the poet David White um, said, I was on a call of his on, on Sunday night, that uh, you know, the, the problem with American politics could be diagnosed as a chronic def deficit in its sense of humor. And what he meant by that was that they don't have the ability to take a step back and realize the mm. absurdity of their position and of the positions across the board. And what absurdity does is it gives you perspective taking just like mindfulness does. And so that's another area where I think there's a key opportunity for tangible social change to occur because of that practice. Um, yeah, just to pick up it, the um, your micro nations bore strong parallels to Chantal Mouffe's um, agonism. Is that agonistics? Agonistics is that yeah. something that you've um, that you've come across and that's influenced that that idea? It's something something perhaps then to um, mm. to to bring into it um, because I think at the level of global politics, um, uh, she 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 talks about agonism. But um, yeah, yeah, just 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 worth checking. Yeah. Out. Uh, so one of the yeah, I mentioned this, this perspective that politicians often often talk about. Um, you know, one of the catchphrases that Tim Lawton has offered, who's the sorry, the Conservative co-chair of the All Party Group, is that mindfulness helps him and his colleagues to disagree better. You know, the disagreement's their job. It's always going to be the case um, that they have ideologies and they have a very different you know way of seeing things but there's there's some way in which that they can they can they can exchange uh, exchange a bit better um but they you know there's a fundamental question of what are the inner capacities that enable 
us to be able to have that sense of humor you know it, 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 it does it require psychological maturity and perspective and disattachment um uh, from from ideas uh, and we're only at the very very beginning of of understanding that let alone how it can be sort of inculcated at a population level but uh, it's crucial i'm curious anna to get your reflections on that uh the the you know the, given your uh, research in personal development and how that takes place in in culture what relationship you see there yeah i think i i mean one of the thoughts i just had that just popped into my head was um you know because there are all these studies on on the effects of mindfulness um that try to measure very specific and find evidence on very very specific you know capacity building um potentials of of the technology and i just um wondered whether some of the effects of mindfulness are not emergent you know in in the sense that they're quite unpredictable and, and can't be captured very neatly in in um in you know psychological studies and measured i know mm -hmm. some can and you, you've presented an amazing um document with with you know lots and lots of evidence um attached to it but i just wondered about the kind of emergent potential of of mindfulness and that would link it up with you know and Ronan, also what you talked about, the complicated majorities and how to construct them and how, you know, what kind of role emergence can play in that. Um, so I just wondered what you thought of that, you know, mindfulness as triggering emergent, unpredictable effects. Yeah, there's a couple, couple of things that spring to mind there. You know, I mentioned this two modes of mind in, in McGilchrist's uh, uh, work as an example of um, raising up the holistic intuitive there's something particularly about uh, presencing you know attention regulation embodiment connecting to values integrating these different modes of mind that enable you to uh, to connect to emergence um, and in fact there's one particular um, intervention I really like called insight dialogue mm. and this is a a method of being able to speak more from emergence and from deep authenticity. And there are, I think, five instructions, meditative instructions for you to remember, have a lot to do with mindfulness. So it's, it's sort of pause. So as you find yourself leaning into the conversation and sort of like, you know, speaking from on automatic pilot and perhaps in the way that you always do, you kind of interrupt that and you go, okay, pause, relax, open, so I'm so I'm tuning into my body and and the world and not having my kind of like uh, my senses constrict around what I'm saying and wanting to get across, and then and then trust emergence, and speak the and speak the truth from that emergence, and you find actually that what speaks isn't really somehow you like something speaking through you almost. You it can become a meditation, a very you know bring bringing mindfulness to the relational space. You can actually just as I'm doing actually in this moment. I don't feel like I'm speaking right now and what I'm listening to myself in as much as you are um, through basically mindful relational practice. So, so I think that this is, this is a relatively new innovation and that there's, again, a lot more that could be explored in that area. Just one thing I'd add to that is, um, and, and, and this is where we go kind of off rails from the evidence-based train tracks that we're all comfortable with, but is, you know, the concept of the soul as intangible as it is, and its relationship with genuinely creating a different type of civilization, and how much of our action, our words, our routines, our scripts, the, the culture that we co-create comes from personality, which is a defense mechanism that made sense when we were children, and that lives on inside of us and hasn't been able to be healed and overcome and restored, and how when we do engage with the practices that Jamie talks about. We actually stop, allow us to feel whatever is going on, to let life in, that a different presence and essence emerge, emerges that is called soul, that has often an entirely different vision for what you're supposed to do with your life, um, you know, either in that moment or in the long arc. And I do wonder about what the collective potential is of people genuinely taking that seriously um, and what kind of world that creates. 
Yeah, yeah I think. So, um, sorry, go on, Rose. No, sure. Um, the the frustrating thing about about doing work like this and trying to as soon as as soon as there's something that you need to convince people um, about on a large scale, then you have to start looking um, at the evidence, and um, the evidence usually comes in the form of things that you can count. Um, and at the end of the day, r rarely do you find people sort of doing this kind of work um, f for for quite those reasons, um, mm. rather than because of um, the the intangible, the emergent um, extraordinariness of, of what's kind of of what's been touched and, and discovered together, sort of through through these practices. Um, that's where the evangelists come from. But um, then we've got to do the the work of the counting you reminded me there's one thing actually i wanted to come back on what anna said before we open to questions um and that is um mindfulness the concept i mean it is very it's very definitely uh, a natural human capacity and it's a very specific thing um uh that if we get too vague about inner capacities and meditation it kind of gets lost on the other hand it has also kind of been an umbrella concept that's been at the vanguard of, of starting a conversation in this area that's kind of groaning under the weight of all the things it's trying to represent because it's been a, a safe word that you can use to represent inner development and meditation when meditation is now getting kind of um, uh, re rehabituated or rather it, you know, it, it's now safe to use that word but initially mindfulness was kind of a safer thing to talk about. And we're seeing that that started and starting to, you know, necessarily break apart um, so that we have other things that we can talk about. And mindfulness, rather than becomes just the thing in the vanguard, it, it sits as an enabling factor or like one in a capacity amongst others. And so it, it, it includes compassion, it includes embodiment, it includes some nervous system regulation, it includes ethics in some ways of conceiving of it. But also we should really what would be better is to have a more nuanced conversation where actually all of these have, have things have their place within the constellation of inner capacity development um and uh and so i see that as being an you know that that as being an emergent <laughs> an emergent thing we're, we're getting to that stage of, of uh, the maturity of the sector yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that speaks to um, Richard's question as well about sort of, you know, what might be other words for mindfulness, because the word is sort of captured and polluted. Mm. And I think, you know, we don't need to sort of rebrand mindfulness, but it's time to take a little of, of the pressure off it now that it has opened the door for um, for these other um, valuable mm. and nuanced practices. Yeah, I was in a webinar last night about equanimity, which which many would say is a really important part of mindfulness. Forget that someone's done a PhD specifically on equanimity as a cultivable quality. Sorry, Anna, I'll let you um, take take back over. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Um, I think we should now open up um, the space for everyone. So please keep putting your questions in the chat book. And I'm I'm not now just going to call on um, some of the people who have asked their questions first. So I think we had one. Um, by, let me just see, sorry, I'm just trying to find the first question. I think it was by um, Alan Charlton, um, had a question on introduction of mindfulness practices into schools. Alan, would you like to, to ask your question, please? Uh, hi, yeah, thanks. Um, wow. Sorry, that was just kind of some instant feedback because uh, I've been muted for an hour and I'm like, wow, <laughs> an emerge, gosh. Um, so um, I was a school teacher for nearly 20 years, but it's only one of the careers I've had. I stopped in 2000 and I've done a load of other stuff since then, but I'm aware of the fact I've got a lot of friends who are parents and who are teachers and so on who say that mindfulness in UK schools, and I'm aware of the fact that it occurs in other countries as well, has had a massive positive impact on the way in which the mental health elements of being a child in school and dealing with the shit that you've got to deal with on a daily basis has had a really positive impact. And just thinking in terms of how I first came into contact with Ronan, 
was through an organization some of you might have heard called XR, which fortunately we haven't mentioned today. But, but from that point of view, it was a young woman from Sweden who had kind of dropped out of school for a while to kind of challenge the whole idea. And I'm just thinking, is this something that we need, if we're rethinking what education is about, what its purpose is, shouldn't the evidence base that you've got be sitting in the Department of Education and Science now saying it isn't just adults who are decision makers, you know, it's children who are decision makers as well. So we need to give them access to the tool. That's what my question is about. How do we do that? And you obviously clearly have a, a foot into um, politicians thinking. So that might, that's my initial question anyway. Great, thank you. Um, Jamie and Rosie. So yes, we ha we've had six. We've had we had meetings with successive secretaries of state for education in the UK, um, and they've all been very sort of warm and positive and said nice things, and then nothing happened. Uh, <laughs> um, but we did, we th we think help to get mindfulness in the picture for uh, a, a particular trial of mental health innovations and mindfulness in in, in schools. Um, one of the challenges is, like you say, the purpose of education. And mindfulness is getting a, a look in when it comes to shoring up mental health and well being. In some cases, it's considered around behavior and, and attainment. But the deeper potential, um, which many of the writers and thinkers of, uh, in the Emerge Network have pointed to, is in reimagining education. Uh, and when we're looking at how we address the crises that we're facing. You know, I like um, Zach Stein's phrase that, you know, if, if education isn't the answer, you're asking the wrong question. I think that's something like that. Uh, so again, our, our influence on policymakers is restricted by something more fun fundamental. Like what is the role of education? What is the role of government in, in relation to the inner capacities of citizens? But that we are both in the short term, trying to get um, skillful mindfulness into, into schools, both through a policy channel and through working you know, in grassroots, and also a little bit trying to chip away at that, um, that more fundamental framing. Yeah. Great, thank you. We have another question by Mark Leonard about the um, social function. Social factors, sorry. Um, oh, Mark, thank, thank hello, you. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, um, social factors appear to be more important than mindfulness practice in mindfulness course outcomes. This is um, a, a recent article from Brown uh, University talking about work, uh, some really interesting work. Well, one or two, only one real, real, real paper and they not don't seem to be much looking at this aspect of outcomes and mindfulness courses, but it, they report that the social factors may be more important than the actual meditation or the amount of meditation that takes place. And um, might this be, the point that I'm making is, might this not only be significant in design of mindfulness courses, but this be significant as agency is really something that takes place in a social or collective context. You know, as individuals were disempowered uh, it's really changes something that is really a, a, a cultural or social or group thing that really when it take, takes takes uh, can really have an impact. Mm. Well, first of all, I just want to recognise your contribution to the to the conversation, Mark, as a, as one Thank of you. the innovators in the space who has has been you know over uh, much of the last seven or eight years been sort of. Um, uh, suggesting that this is a direction for, for, for necessary growth for the mindfulness sector. Uh, I haven't yet read that paper. Um, I'm aware that over the last few years, there's been a lot of like meditation is the most important thing and like the outcome is completely dependent on how much meditation you do. And in some other cases, it's like um, actually it's the social container or it, it's the psychoeducation content. And to be honest with you, I'm not close enough to the current state of where the kind of cut and thrust of that debate is at, at, at the moment. Certainly the, some, some of the very few longitudinal studies I'm aware of, you know, follow-ups over 
eight years or something like that do show that the actual daily practice is the thing that changes the lives but um but but yeah it, without a doubt it's a huge huge part of it um and you know one of the things that we've discussed in the past is uh yeah th th thinking about it not just as a collective a collection of individuals in the room but as a group being what otto sharma calls the circle being you know who come together in this kind of for, for many people a very profound and very unusual process of coming together for two hours once a week for eight weeks with even you know, a retreat day in the middle of it which is how most of the evidence is built on this kind of eight-week format to go through a you know, quite an intense psychosocial intervention and form quite a lot of serious you know, substantial bonds and then stay in touch with them with, with, with people on the course after that point people who stay in touch and have a practice group etc are much more likely in my probably my opinion rather than thinking about the evidence base to, to, to have significant change and a weakness here is that we haven't got a kind of follow-up structure, communities of practice, um, like we had in the British Parliament. Like the, the success of what we've done there is largely because there's a weekly drop-in class at 5.30 every Friday. Um, and that has been the, the, the kind of underpinning of the, of the cultural shift and the deeper conversations we've had over the years. Yeah. And we had a question from Richard about um, other words for mindfulness. I think, Rosa, you've already started to answer that one. Um, but maybe you wanted to elaborate. Uh, Richard, would you like to ask a question? Sure. I, I, you know, I don't have a crisp, uh, crisp question, actually. Um, but I do. I'm a, I'm a uh, coach in North Carolina. And I work with people primarily on what I call spiritual intelligence and creativity. And most of the people I work with are working one way or another in some kind of institutional setting, you know, be it corporate, be it academic, whatever it may be. And, you know, there's, there's just a, a phase you have to go through when the subject of mindfulness is brought up of essentially cynicism. So many people have in their corporate lives are being promoted and sometimes even required to be in mindfulness type practice of some kind. Mm -hmm. And people are smart. They're, they're, they can see that what this is, is, to, is basically a relaxation technique to make them happier and less stressed with the status quo that they're in. So you begin to work with people on, you know, uh, what, on really this question, I think, uh, or these words that came up before, what is the inner capacity for an engagement that a person has with the world? So that's where you start start with the working, but it's all about language before it's about practice, if that makes any sense. So, you know, it just, I, I, I'm fr I am frustrated with the common use of the word mindfulness, even if people are cynical about it. Um, for most people involved, it hasn't in any way opened up avenues to a more um, profound, let's say, uh, transformative capacity. So in my work, I'm always work working with people on what, what I think was referred to here as stepping back, the ability to step back in real time kind of throughout your day in order to get a, a better perspective. I'm rambling now. It's frustration, really. And so I guess, I guess I'm saying, you know, what other words can we use? And if we did use other words, what would we lose? You know, people might mm. not know at all what we're talking about. Mm. It's sort of open-ended, if that makes any sense. I think but I'm talking about it. I work on this, this stepping back, this inner capacity, whatever, at the habitual level, the pause, at the more... Um, complete individual or the complete person, the ability to take in, assess, weigh, transform, cross one thing with another, etc. Anyway, hmm. I don't work with people in any way likely to read a paper. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. I'd be interested to know what Ronan, Ronan uh, seems well, to be keen to say. 
Uh, no, I was just interested in, in, in asking what I heard from you, Richard, just more directly. Is there any data on especially corporate mindfulness programs who goes on to a lifetime journey of deeper spiritual practice that might lead to some kind of engaged, committed action to, you know, I don't know, citizenship or a better world and who uses it as a kind of a well-being numbing device or whatever. I'm, 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 is there anything? Cause that's, you know, the current like mindfulness critique. I'm just wondering, is it based on any data that that's what's happening? That's a really good question. I, I, I'd like to explore that myself. I mean, in, Speaking with people I work with, many, many people go on a, you know, a journey of transformation. They just don't associate it with their work. <laughs> you know, it's a mismatch between what, what you're, and so they might go in a different direction because they're jaded on the subject, quote unquote, mindfulness. But no, I, I think that's a really good question. I don't have an answer to it. Jamie? Yeah, that there is uh, not any data that I'm aware of. There is a difference between the US and the U and the Europe in terms of teaching culture. Um, and, and the mindfulness critique is born of a teaching landscape that I don't understand as well as the European one. Mm. And I think a lot of people felt it was extremely unfair here um because of what the intentions are behind the 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 intervener the uh, yeah the intervention um and the work of the interveners that and and actually you know f from what i've heard of some of the us practices that actually there's a lot perhaps a lot more substance in those those critiques however anecdotally Mindfulness doesn't seem to lower staff turnover. In some cases, it increases it. And actually, it doesn't help you to put up with the status quo. But some of this embodiment and sensitivity and values alignment increases staff turnover um, where yeah. other conditions aren't being addressed. Um, and uh, that people often leave to yeah, do other things or become mindfulness teachers in, in, in some cases. Um, and yeah, I have many, many examples of that across schools, hospitals, and 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 workplaces, where where things are otherwise happy and and or, or problems are being being addressed, it leads to increased staff engagement, lower turnover, but that it isn't a quick fix to um, to keep people working. Um, but that, yeah, I I. Um, my sense of working with people who are actually the ones who bring them into corporates, that this is a bottom-up grassroots initiative in almost all of these workplaces, that this, this is people sharing it with each other because of it's helped them. Mm. And that, that this isn't from the top down in order to improve some bottom line. And mm. we, you know, one of the things that we do is actually hold a professional network for champions of mindfulness in the workplace. So we have corporate members in Ernst & Young and HSBC and Lloyds Bank and Roche Pharmaceutical Company and GSK and, you know, and these people have in some cases done like clear career limiting things in order to really passionately build this network of mindfulness practitioners. And some people have been like, I'm, you know, in tears and almost leaving an organization because the toxic culture because of our network stayed with a vision to build out a mindfulness network and create change from within. And this is on one of these like really big multinationals on this example I'm thinking of. Mm. And now this person has a network of like 25 mindfulness trainers all, all around the world and thousands of people of joining mindfulness calls and who's also engaged in this you know, perspectives that Mark have raised around sort of the social element. So my data, which is obviously skewed by who I happen to come across and who happens to, you know, come to us is that this is, grassroots inner change interesting emergent phenomena rather than a you know an organ of um, social control but could be different elsewhere well I, I, that's very that's for you do i do see that i hear mm -hmm. that and that's and that's good to hear because the key words that from what i'm talking about is that mindfulness as you propose it as a as, as capacity for action 
is a career limiter in a lot of organizations. And so it would have to come at a grassroots, you know, kind of Samizdat type of <laughs> type of level. Anyway, thank you for all that. Yeah. Um, thank you. I think I think also often um, these critiques rest on a really outdated separation between um, inner development and pure social act social activism. You know, I think that's a, um, a a distinction that exists in academia, but not in the field. I mean, not from what I see. Um, this kind of strict separation between sort of selfish inner and good outwards orientated, socially transformative outer action. And, and from what I see and what, you know, emerges is all about and Perspectiva is all about is precisely that the two are interlinked. Um, and I think that's also something that's very interesting because it's like a sort of really persistent rumor in, in academia that those fears are still very neatly separate and, and they, they aren't anymore and they haven't been for quite a long time but academia tends to be quite slow in catching up with these developments so um, that's I, I would say another thing that always troubled me about about Peirce's critique in particular. Anna can I ask a question either to you or, or Jamie which is um... The degree to which mindfulness buffers against authoritarian tendencies, either resistance to growing authoritarian regimes or to authoritarian values. There was obviously for the last couple of years uh, a naive belief in the psychedelic community that you just needed to take psychedelics and you become a liberal. And, and people pointed to that study about openness to experience increasing by 25% when you had a LSD trip or a psilocybin. Um, but then, you know, we saw, we see now the happy marriage of spirituality and conspiracy theories and QAnon and the QAnon shaman became this kind of symbol that burst that myth. And I'm just wondering what, to what degree that is also true in mindfulness, mm. um, just given the road ahead and the likely for more authoritarian futures. Mm. I, th I think that's more about the link between openness to experience and left wing views and the assumptions there, because yes, Yes, there is significant, uh, there is there is substantial evidence that mindfulness leads to openness to experience. And there is some, you know, Otto Simonson is one person doing political atti attitudes work. Um, and we don't want to say mindfulness makes you more left wing because it'd be the kiss of death for us in Parliament working with conservatives and, and trying to make this a kind of like, you know, building the, these kind of sense making perceptual capacities across the political spectrum, you know. Um, uh, but yes, there is evidence that it leads to openness to experience. Does that therefore mean that you're less likely to be authoritarian? That's a, a question for political scientists, um, perhaps. Uh, and uh, there are there are you know increasing numbers who are who are interested um, in meditation. Um, I do want to jump back a little bit as well, though, and just very quickly say something about the language question that, that Richard mentioned there, and that. I've, I'm feeling more confident uh, talking about inner capacities than just mindfulness or going in talking about inner capacities. And it's interesting that when Jonathan Rouston and I were talking about um, the, the title for this session, you know, he felt that inner capacities was the thing to talk about. Like, and, and that's been echoed with a few other interactions I've had recently. So the question is, you know, do we need to, as I think, did, did you say, like, do we need to launder the word mindfulness and, and, and redeem it and, and say, no, 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 you've got it wrong. It's like, you know, or do we say, OK, well, let's move forward. Let's try and find another phrase to talk about this area. And what is lost in that? You know, because, again, you get could it become so nebulous um, and vague that actually no one knows what anyone's talking about? Open question for me. Sorry, Ronan, is there anything you wanted to come back on on the, on the openness thing? Because I think that's really, really key. Uh, yeah, I just think it's a bit of a black box, the, the connection between all of these internal capacity building exercises and political attitudes um, and, and also the, the trap of um, imposing, let's say, your own liberal ideology onto that and wanting that to be the case, which I think is present for our particular subculture. So, Anna, I'd be curious to hear if you've any reflections on that from research that you've done or what you've encountered. Yeah, sorry, can you just repeat the question, Ronan? Um, the connection between mindfulness and other exercises around personal development 
and political views. Um, whether there's anything that you've come across that would shed light on on this kind of these two separate worlds. Yeah, I have. I'm, I have. I've read some some psychological psychological research on, you know, for example, humility and um, political views and um, openness. I think someone in the chat also just mentioned openness. Yeah, Matthew mentioned openness to experience uniquely out of the big five also correlates with vertical maturational growth. But I think overall, my impression is that you can't really map um, map them so neatly on the kind of left right spectrum. Um, I have never come across any studies that say with sort of definitiveness that, you know, what what Jamie fears will be, you know, killing off his <laughs> um, his uh, contracts um that that mindfulness um makes you more left-wing i mean and openness to experience and you you mentioned some examples um ron and some recent examples where sort of spirituality turns into conspirituality and um and where where you have um emerging of um of tendencies that that you would wouldn't normally think go together so so easily um, so I think it's it's more complex than than we than we might might think this question of you know how it maps onto politics and political views and, and you know I think they're quite emergent <laughs> to come back to this term um, but I just wanted to you know to return to this idea of, of capability um, and and you know this term Jamie that you prefer in our capability development because I think language and metaphors are really really very very important and um and sometimes rephrasing something and using a different kind of vocabulary might make it accessible to to a broader audience um but capability is a really nice term i just thought about it you know in in, in the sense of what we're capable of mm -hmm. um you know and what what kind of capacity have capacity that we can um, develop. So it's also, in that sense, a, a very kind of expansive term, you know, one that 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 points to what we can develop. Um, and in that sense, it, it, it chimed with me as well, you know, something that can be grown and developed. Mm. Nice point Do, to end on. Okay, yeah, we I just had a look at the time. And um, so we're time. Um, I think that's the moment where I would like to thank everyone really, really warmly. So thank you, Rosie. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Ronan. And thank you, everyone who um, came and contributed. And um, thank you for your wonderful questions um, and also your contributions in the chat. Thanks so much for having us, guys. It's been really great. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Anna. Thanks, Jamie. Thanks, Rosie. Thanks, Ronan. Thanks, Nicole, as well, for hosting. Yeah, really good. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.